in our church, um, I'm very thankful as the years have progressed, uh, there are many more people who have become homeowners in our church. Some of them are right here today. Um, many more people who are purchasing homes and owning homes. And uh, as a homeowner, I've learned many lessons over the years of owning a home and taking care of a house. But one lesson I'll share about is something that I learned the hard way is that when you own a home, you have to hire contractors for different things, plumbing or electrical or different things that are going on, and they fix things, carpentry, air conditioning, whatever it is. And I realized that there are many good contractors out there who you can hire, great people. But unfortunately, there are also some contractors who are robbers, who are out to take you. Uh, several years ago, um, our house, which is nearly uh, 100 years old, it needed new insulation because when we first moved in, like cold air was just coming through all the walls because there was no insulation. So I was walking around the neighborhood, and I saw this man. He was installing spraying insulation into a house just a couple blocks away. They were in installing insulation into all the cavities. So I stopped by to talk to him, and it seemed like he was a great guy. He was nice. He was friendly. He had a business card. He had a van. He had a website. He seemed legit. And so because I saw him doing a job just a couple blocks from me, it's not like he just approached my door and rang the doorbell, but I was seeing him doing a job in my neighborhood. So I, I totally thought, this guy's legit. And so I trusted him. But I didn't realize that he was going to rob me. So through that conversation, he said he needed to buy supplies, and I would just have to pay a deposit for the supplies. So I thought, fine, that's, that's okay. So I actually gave him money without signing anything, without any paperwork. I gave him money so that he could buy the sp supplies, and then he was going to come to our house next Tuesday. Well, next Tuesday came, and I was waiting outside, at 8.30 a.m. when he said he'd be there, long story short, he never showed up. He didn't answer his phone. I couldn't get a hold of him. He had robbed me. I tried to pursue it. I even tried to have him served, but I never got the money back, and he had robbed me. It was my fault in the end, but he had robbed me. I don't know if you've ever been robbed in some way, whether it's your money, your time, maybe even your purity, but we all get robbed in some way. When we get robbed, it's like someone that's taking something that doesn't belong to them, and it can be upsetting. It can be devastating. Now, in this passage, God actually uses the word rob. You are robbing from me. He says to his people, you are robbing me. Those are some fierce words. Now think about in these last words to his people that he dearly loves, this is one of the things that God has on his mind that he wants to leave his people with before the 400 years of intertestamental period before the New Testament begins. So I believe that as we look at this passage today, it's something that you and I, we all need to hear as well because perhaps, maybe we don't even realize it, but maybe we are robbing God as well. Well, as we've been going on in Malachi, you know, we've been going through, uh, we've gone through chapter 1 and 2 and into some of 3. We talked about, I have loved you. It dealt with apathy. We talked about great among the nations. It dealt with sacrifices that people were bringing. Uh, we talked about covenant marriage. It dealt with idolatry, loving other gods. Talked about last week, where is the God of justice? We talked about social justice, different things like that. Well, as we look at this passage, if you remember this idea of sacrifice from a couple of weeks ago, I think God is continuing that theme a little bit, and we're going to talk about three things this morning. First of all, we'll talk about problem of robbing. Secondly, from this passage, I think it just flows like this, practice of tithing. And the third, we'll talk about the promise of blessing. Let me just warn you, most time will be spent in the second point, 
Third point would just be like a minute or two. So most time is in the second point. So don't get discouraged in the second point. Third point is just really quick. So just letting you know. So tithing, uh, robbing, tithing, and blessing. So first of all, let's talk about problem of robbing. Look at verse 8. It says, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, remember that disputational style, but you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Wow, so there's an obvious problem stated here that the people of God are robbing God. Now, does it mean that they were putting on ski masks, holding flashlights, and breaking into the temple late at night like burglars? No, they were robbing God, and the way they were doing that is by not being stewards of all that God has given to them, as we'll talk about. In other words, they were robbing God by not properly coming to worship at the temple with what God's words had commanded for them to bring when they come and worship. Again, if you recall a few weeks ago, the issue was these people were bringing imperfect, blemished sacrifices. They were bringing not the best animals, but they were bringing the animals that were the ones that did, didn't want, the ones that had problems, had broken legs, and they didn't want them anyway. So they were just giving them to God, their leftovers, and God was so upset because he himself would one day give his only son to be a perfect sacrifice on the cross, and yet these people were bringing their leftovers, their unwanted scraps of animals. Today is a similar sort of theme, except now it focuses specifically on tithes and offerings, or contributions, as it says in this passage. People were supposed to bring tithes and offerings, but they were holding back from God in worship, and this is the issue that God has in mind. In fact, when you look here in verse 8 and 9, it seems like perhaps these people had become so accustomed to worshiping in this way that they weren't even aware of what they were doing wrong. Maybe they were, maybe they're not. So the question in their hearts, verse 8, is, have how have we robbed you? They're, they're here worshiping. They're lifting their hands. They're serving. They're doing stuff. And they're saying, how, how have we robbed you, God? And so God is very clear, very direct in verse 8, saying, in your tithes and contributions. So obviously, this is dealing with their sin of not properly giving their possessions and their money, their tithes and offerings. They were covenant people that they were supposed to give to their covenant God and worship. Now, as we think about this problem of robbing God, I think we can think about just a couple types of people here. There might be more, but I think about a couple types of people. Number one, I think about stingy people, stingy persons. This is the type of person that could tithe, but chooses not to, for their own gain. Uh, they see the difference that that extra 10% makes in their financial calculations, and they want more. They want it for themselves. They want the sense of security that gives to them. They want the comfort that it provides for them. And so in that way, we could say there's a stingy person that God might be speaking to here. I think there's another type of person, though, it's a struggling person. This person, they may genuinely want to tithe, but they just feel like they cannot afford to. They've got bills to pay, credit card debt, a car loan, a mortgage, and when they think about tithing, when they think about helping their parents and doing other, when they think about all the obligations, the calculations do not seem to add up and just don't seem to work. And they're thinking, there's no way I can afford to tithe. And they're struggling with it. Even though they want to, they're struggling with it. Well, I think we have to keep those people in mind as we look at this. Now, interestingly, in verse 9 here, it says that 
the whole nation is cursed because of this. I was thinking about it like, why can't it just be that guy who isn't tithing? Why can't it be that person who isn't being faithful? And it makes me think that probably there were some people in Israel who were being faithful. They were probably giving as commanded. They were giving their tithes and offerings. But even by some not being faithful, God calls them out not as individuals but as a whole, as a whole nation, as a community. Their sin affects everyone in the eyes of God. We need to realize that our sins are not just individual, but they do impact and affect us communally as God's people too. So we need to think about this issue that God is bringing up as a church community. We are not just individuals, but we are a community that God sees as a whole. So we can ask ourselves, what would be God's word to our church in this area right now? Ask yourself also individually, what would be God's words to you right now in this area of your life that God does seem to take very seriously. So I think we need to talk about these things. So first, we saw the problem of robbing that's going on. Now secondly, we're going to get into the practice of tithing. Look at verse 10. God says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. I want to talk about, first of all, Old Testament tithing, law of Old Testament tithing. Just a few verses, look at from the Old Testament about tithing. Genesis 14.20, this is about Abraham. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything in worship. So Abraham here, he went on a rescue mission to save Lot. He encounters Melchizedek, who is like a picture of Christ for Abraham. And what does Abraham do? Abraham worships by giving a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, the priest. He worshiped. He gave offering. He gave the tithe. Genesis 18.22. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a tenth, full tenth to you. This is about Jacob. He has a dream in which God reminds him of the covenant promises that were made to Abraham and Isaac and now to him. And do you see how Jacob sees that everything he has is from God? God has given him everything. And so what does he do? He worships by giving a full tenth back to God as he surrenders himself in love and adoration and worship. This is how he worships, by giving a tithe in worship to the Lord. Leviticus 27, verse 30. It says, Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So God is teaching the Israelite people how they are to worship. And when they come to the temple, they are to bring their tithes and contributions. Now, when you look at this, it says every tithe, whether seed, fruit. Keep in mind that this was an agrarian society. Some of you, if you've gone to Haiti with us, you've been to the Sunday service where people come up to give their offering during church service. Some people give money, but many people who are farmers and raising crops, they bring a chicken, or they bring eggs, or they bring crops as their offering, as their tithe. This is what it was like in these days. So nowadays, everything's monetized into actual money, but in these days, money, wealth was represented by their crops. And God is teaching Israeli people how to worship. He's establishing this practice of worshiping by tithing whatever they have as they would work the land generate crops, generate income for themselves. They were giving it to the Lord as a tithe. Uh, Numbers 18 to 26. It says, And you may eat in any place, 
you and your households, for it is your reward in return for your service in the tent of meeting. This is talking about the Levites, the priests. So these, this passage is showing how tithes were needed, were collected at the temple, and one of the uses was to support and care for the Levites. They couldn't work land themselves. They didn't own land themselves. And so they needed the support of other people that was given through tithing because their calling, their ministry, their job was to care for the temple. They were full-time ministers. So these Levites are like full-time pastors today. They were not working in the marketplace, but they were not working in the fields generating on their own, but their calling was caring for the temple so that other people could come to worship and they could conduct sacrifice and they could lead worship. So the system created provision for them. Now, when you look at the Old Testament, we just looked at a few verses. We could look at many more, but when you look, in addition to the tithe, there were actually several times throughout the Old Testament where people were asked to give additional offerings, contributions for things like festivals and money for the poor. Now, some scholars estimate that the annual required giving with tithes and contributions for an Israelite was about 25% of their income. Now, it's interesting here in verse 10 when it says, bring the full tithe. God is really emphasizing Give the tithe and also give contributions. It's a system that would allow for the temple ministry to be done and for the poor and the needy to be provided for through the people of God. Now, I was thinking about this. I was so thankful for recently how our church, we had an offering time where people were able to give contributions for our COVID-19 mercy fund. And I'm so thankful those two Sundays, how many of you generously gave on top of your tithe, giving contributions, offerings, so that we would be able to provide for people who are in need. I think that's the same principle here when God says, bring the full tithe, bring the offering so that the storehouses may be full, so that when needs arise, we will be able to respond. That's what we're doing with this fund. When needs are arising, we will be ready to help someone in that time. You know, often it's like that. When God provides, he usually doesn't drop it from the sky. Usually when God provides, he provides through the hands of people around us. And when we give tithes and contributions, this is how God provides. And so we are actually privileged to be involved in these ministries of mercy by being faithful in these tithes and contributions. So that's just a little bit of Old Testament giving based on the law. Now, secondly then, we want to talk about faith of New Testament giving. Faith in New Testament giving. Now in the New Testament, Jesus certainly calls us to continue this pattern this life of giving. Look in Matthew twenty two twenty one. He says, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, that's taxes, and to God the things that are God's, that's tithes and contributions. So he was calling believers, Christians in the early church, be faithful. Be faithful because you are under a government, so you pay your taxes, but also... As God's people, covenant people, you are called to tithe and to give offering. Now, an immediate question we have to ask is, that was Old Testament, there was laws given, but now in the New Testament, are we required to give a tenth of our annual revenue like the Old Testament Israelites were? We're we're people of the New Testament church. So are we still required in this way? Well, I want to talk about this briefly. The word tithe is not used anywhere in the New Testament. You will not find it mentioned in the New Testament. But if you've been at our church for a while, you've heard me explain how when you look at the Old Testament laws, they were divided mostly into three categories. You can think about civil laws, ceremonial laws, and moral laws. So Civil laws had to do with Israel as a nation. 
governing as a nation. So we are not the nation of Israel, so we are not bound to those things in the Old Testament that apply to Israel as a nation for their civil laws. There are also ceremonial laws when you look in the Old Testament. These had to do with worship at the temple. We no longer go to the temple to worship because Christ has died for us and no longer sacrifice is needed. So we no longer worship at the temple like they did back then. So some of those ceremonial laws we are not bound to anymore. And then there are moral laws. These are based on the Ten Commandments. These transcend time and culture. So we are bound to these because they relate to how we love God and we love others. So if tithing was related to ceremonial law for worship at the temple, when you come to the temple, bring the full tithe, does that mean we have to tithe? Are we mandated by the Bible? Is it biblical if someone says to you, the Bible says that you must tithe? Is that correct? I would say the answer is both yes and no. I would say no because we are no longer bound by the ceremonial laws which included this principle of tithes and contributions. It had to do with temple worship. But I would say, yes, tithing in the Old Testament was used to make ministry of the temple possible by supporting the Levites, modern-day pastors, servants, and helping the poor, ministering to the needy. In that same way, I would say we need to tithe as a minimum basis in order to make the ministry of our local churches possible, functioning just like the temple functioned in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, I I would say God was training his children of Israel to give generously, and he trained them by giving them the law. But in the New Testament, God is calling his bride to a spirit of generous and cheerful giving that flows from the heart. So it's a yes and no sort of thing. Now, remember there were two types of people that we talked about. We talked about stingy and struggling. What should you do if you are a stingy person? I would say, You should repent and believe. Repent of your greed and desire for security in what money brings and what money gives you. But related to that, I would say believe. Believe that God alone is what you truly desire and he alone is what you really find your security in. So if you're struggling with that, I I just... I want to build my wealth. I want to build my mountain. I want to build my house. I would say repent and believe. What should you do if you're a struggling person? I would say the same thing. Repent and believe. Repent because perhaps you don't trust that God can provide when your calculations turn red. And then believe that God is always the provider and that he is faithful and he will give you what you need. He will provide your necessities. Trust him by believing. I love verse 10, which says, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. So God challenges us to test him. Very few, rare times will we be allowed to test God, but God here says concerning this topic, test me. Test me. Try me. See if I'm faithful. See if I will provide for you or not when you give, as I've asked you to. God is saying, just trust me. Maybe you've dug yourself into a financial hole with some bad decisions, but as you get out of it, I'm going to help you. Just trust me. You know, by no means is this a license to, okay, I'll tithe and then I'll be wasteful with all my money, live extravagantly, expecting God to provide when I end up in a situation. I think it's calling us to live as careful and wise stewards of all that God has provided for us. Knowing that, trusting that, believing that he will take care of our needs. 
some basic principles that sums that up, I believe. I would say four things. Give with heart. Never think God needs our money. God owns everything. So our giving should be a reflection of our love for him. Our giving should be a reflection and overflow of our hearts. So give with heart. Don't give with, oh, I have to give, obligation, all this kind of feeling, but give with your heart and love. Another principal suggestion is give it now. Uh, seek to grow in giving over time. I would encourage, especially in our church, many of us are younger, 20s, 30s, or 40s, whatever, give now because what happens is as you progress in your career, as you get promotions, as you get raises, as you get income increases, what happens is it becomes harder and harder. As lifestyle creep, lifestyle inflation comes in, it becomes harder and harder because you didn't give when you had a little. It becomes hard to give when you have a lot. And so learn to give a little bit more each time. You know, if you cut the grass as a kid and you make $10, giving a dollar is no big deal. If you start to make $1,000, giving $100, it's a little difficult, but you can do it. But when you start to make $100,000, Tithing, $10,000, that becomes very difficult. And so if you don't build that into your life now, it'll be very hard to do it later. So give it now. I would say also give in faith. I have a friend who's a dentist, and he shared this phrase with me that's always stuck with me. He was a dentist doing very well, but he had lots of loans. He had a mortgage to pay. He had children to raise, lots of expenses. But he said one day, He said, you know, it takes great faith to tithe. I thought that was interesting. He says, it takes great faith to tithe. It's difficult, and you feel all these obligations, and you calculate things, but it takes faith to trust and believe that God's going to provide as he promised, and he says, test me, see if I will provide. So give in faith believing that God who loves us will provide for us. And finally, I would say give us stewards. If you have a mindset where everything you have is not yours, but everything is God's to begin with, then you stop seeing yourself as an owner. You stop seeing yourself as, this is mine, this is mine. But if you see it all as God, it's, it's God's money, it's God's car, it's God's house, it's God's stuff, it's God's children, and I'm a steward, then we change. We go from being self-protectors to selfless stewards. And it changes our mindset. So I would encourage us, give us stewards. You know, I thought it'd be helpful if I could just get very practical in this message. You know, I feel like this is a topic that over the years we maybe haven't talked about in detail enough. So I just thought about like a typical person maybe in our church and just a way to think through this process. So I'm just going to give almost like a case study, not using numbers, but just a case study of how to think about this a little bit. If I were sitting with you and I was just saying, this is how you can go through this process if you have a new job or something, just how to think about it. So, let me start with this. Getting real practical here. Let's say you're working, you have a great job or something, and you have a gross salary that comes in. And so I'm just, I'm just trying to put flesh to things here. Um, you have a gross salary that you're given. You have taxes that are automatically taken out before you even get your paycheck. Remember, give to Caesar what is Caesar. So we pay taxes. We don't have a choice. We pay taxes. I would encourage my suggestion. These are my suggestions now. Many of you at your jobs, you have things like 401k. I would say you're responsible to think long term and to plan for your future. And this is something that you also can automate. And so set it up so that's automated, a strong percentage there. I would also say then... From that point, what you do is you automate, I would really encourage you, automate, so you have self-accountability, automate your tithe through the different means that we have, and you automate that so that it goes to your local church. And if you go to some other church in the future, please tithe to that local church wherever you go. 
you automate that. And just a side note, if this, you want to get more complicated, if you do take out 401k, I would say you could even deduct that amount from your gross because you're going to pay taxes on that later, so you can tie them that later. But next, side point. Next thing is, after that, pay off your debts. You can automate that. So if you have credit card debt, hopefully you don't, but if you do, then you can have a plan and automate against that so that you get rid of that over time. And then after that, you should invest long-term, you should save short-term. Investing more towards retirement, long-term things like buying a house, saving for your next car, saving for your next trip, having buckets of money for that, invest and save. Now after that, you have your living costs. Some are fixed, some are variable. You have your rent or your mortgage, you have your bills, utility bills, food, different things, and you gotta pay all those things and then pretty much after that, I think it comes down to enjoy and give. This is where you can spend money on fun things, spend money on some purchase. I think God wants us to enjoy our money that we work for and God provides us so that we can enjoy. But also, there's giving here. These are where your contributions can come into place. Let's say you want to support a child somewhere. Let's say you want to support a ministry outside of the church, beyond the local church. Let's say you want to help a person. This is where your giving can come into play. So these are the places where you can adjust. So maybe a little less enjoying, a little bit more giving sometimes, and you can make adjustments. But I would say the problem is sometimes when we put the tithing, we put that way at the bottom, and we do that from what's left over, and we say, oh man, now I don't have enough, I can't tithe, I can't afford to tithe. But if we make that an automated priority, then it gives us that accountability that we're doing and we're following and we're being faithful. So I would encourage you to think through some of these things and the order in which you process these things. So that's the practice of tithing. So first, problem of robbing. Second, we talked about this practice of tithing. Finally, just real briefly, we'll see when we are faithful as stewards, there's a promise, a promise of blessing. Look at verse 11. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Look at verse 12. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. These people were worried that, oh, we don't have enough. Or God, if we give all this tithes and contributions, we're not going to have enough food. They were worried about problems and tragedy that might be around the corner that they were just anticipating. And God is promising here that I'm your covenant God then I'm going to take care of you. You're my children. I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to let you down. And if our God is playing out this massive redemptive plan from the beginning of time to send his most precious and beloved son to die for us, do you not think, do you not believe that he would care, not care for you? He loves us and he will not let us go and he will always provide our needs. And in this relationship with our God, all the nations around will look at Israel and their devotion to God and call them blessed because they also see God's devotion to them, his people. There are many people who are living the rat race and trying to accumulate for themselves just like these other nations, and they will realize that there's no better place to be than in a covenant relationship where you are fully devoted to God and God is devoted to us. So this promise for Israel, this promise is for all of us who believe because we are now spiritual Israel. And so there's a promise of blessing God is giving here. He says, you need to give Give what's mine. You need to give. Don't rob me. But it's because I'm going to bless you. Just trust me. I'm going to bless you. So as you think about this passage, 
we see the problem of ri- robbing, practice of tithing, and the promise of blessing. I want to end by just talking about this line that's in verse 7 that I use for the title today. This, this line really got to me because it says, you know, return to me and I will return to you. This whole book of Malachi is about how Israel has, has gone astray spiritually. And it seems like God is really hammering away at this point of how they should come with their sacrifices, how they should come with their tithes and their contributions, their money and their resources. I think it's because money, possessions, it's one of the greatest indicators of how we love God. The greatest indicator, one of the greatest indicators of how we love God is how we use our money. You know, Jesus actually spoke in the New Testament. He didn't say to tithe. He didn't say the word, but he actually spoke about money more than any other single topic. So can I encourage you today? I think these are God's words of love to us. He's not trying to beat us over the head but he's trying to establish this love relationship. I encourage you today, especially if you feel like spiritually you've, you've strayed or you're drifting away from God, don't just say things like, man, I wish I was doing better spiritually. Don't just say things like, oh, I should do my quiet time more. That's part of it, of course. But I would say, in looking at this passage, it seems like There's something about when we give, when we tithe, when we give our offerings, contributions, there's something happening there where we are surrendering what we hold so tightly in our hearts. And sometimes it takes the place of God because we hold on to that as our security, as our comfort, as our backup plan, as our status. We hold on to those things as our identity. But when we start to let go and hold it with an open hand and see ourselves as stewards, give to the Lord as he's called us, something happens in our hearts. And I believe we return to him spiritually. Remember, God doesn't need you and I to give him money. He doesn't need our money. But what he's actually after is our hearts And we are most blessed, we receive the most spiritually when we learn to give because giving this way is actually giving from our hearts because we're letting go of sometimes what we hold on to so tightly. So I hope in a very practical way, many of you would return to him. Do it practically. Return to him because you do that and your heart will follow. Return to him and find that he returns to you as well. Let's pray together.